So the first thing we have on Blackboard, well, let's see. You'll, you'll go to Blackboard for this course. You don't have to do it on yours. Um, you'll go to Blackboard. You'll find this, something like this. Um, there are basically 10 paradigms in this, cor uh, in this course. And um, they basically correspond to each week, more or less. So each week we'll be covering a certain paradigm. Next week we will be covering the paradigm, the city as cosmos. The following week it will be city as machine. And the week after that, city as an organism. These are three prime uh, analogies that have been used uh, very effectively to characterize the way cities work. Uh, and so within each of those themes, about one per week, there are a series of items that you will find in Blackboard. The first one is uh, a recording of this lecture. Every week I will give a lecture on Thursdays, and um, I just turned on the recording, and by the magic of time travel and computers, it's already fully loaded and ready to go. Um, and so my lectures on Thursdays will cover the topic of next week. So if next week's topic is cosmos, I'll give a lecture on cosmos introducing the concept at the end of class. Uh, I will talk quickly. You will not be able to catch everything. It will be too difficult to follow. Uh, good luck. But that's why I record it. So you can uh, experience it again and again. You can share it with your friends and your parents. Uh, before the exam, there are going to be four exams this semester. We can call them quizzes, but I like to call them exams. Um, before the exam, you can, you can experience the lecture again. Um, and because it's a 20 to 30 minute lecture, it's not a big deal to turn it on and review it. Uh, to refresh and try to get a little bit more out of it each time. Um, the, and so that's the first component you're going to find each week is the lecture. Um, the second component is going to be the reading. And I am not the author of every reading we're going to use this uh, semester, but I am the author of several of them. Um, and so the reading for next week is this one I wrote about uh, the city I did research on in central Java. Uh, and it's a great example of the city as a cosmos. Um, and so you can download it. You can read it online. Um, you can have your computer read it to you. I do that. People with learning disabilities uh, uh, or just looking for a helping hand. Sometimes it helps to have your computer read it to us. Um, we like that. Um, OK. The third thing, so, both, so far it's pretty familiar. The third thing is a journal. The journal is to help us read actively. If you read passively, it just kind of floats by like, background noise on the radio. When you read actively, you read aggressively. The first fact of your student life is, I don't have time for this, right? Am I right? Do I have to do this? If I don't have to do if am I being graded on this? I'm not, if I'm not being graded on this, I'm, I can't do it. I'm not allowed to do it uh, by the rule of the student, right? You can only do things that you're getting graded on. So do I have to read this? Yes, I have to read this. Um, then what? Well, you have to write something. You have to actually write two things. The first thing you write is uh, an exploratory set of writing. When I don't know about you, but when I read something, I don't have time to read anything. Right. So if I'm reading something, it's only because someone has their gun to my head. And you're welcome. I have my gun to your head. Um, you must read it. OK. Now, if I'm going to read it, why am I reading it? And how is he going to know I read it? Well, the reason to read it is because there's something in there. There's something in this. It's not all of it. I can't tell where it is when I look at it the first time. But somewhere in there, there must be something useful. 
my professor wouldn't make me read this unless he thought there was something in this that was useful. So, okay, I, I can't spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to go in, I'm going to find what's useful, and I'm going to grab it, and I'm going to take it out. That's why you write. That's why you have a highlighter pen. That's why you, <coughs> you, that's why you keep track of time. You don't just read it and spend three hours reading something or four hours reading something. No. You go in, you take a cup of coffee, you get pumped up, you dive in, and you say, okay, eh, okay, I get the idea. You read the beginning, you read the end, you look through the captions, you, you look at the footnotes maybe, and you say, okay, where's the good stuff? And then you read it, and you, you, you move quickly over the stuff that is not interesting or not useful. Um, and then you say, ah, there's something, and you circle it. <laughs> and then you keep going, and if there's three things in the reading that are really that jump out at you, that's where you put your energy. You circle it, you read it three times, you paraphrase it in your own notes. And that's what this is for. You go into the journal, you create a journal entry, and you write about the things from this reading that are interesting to you. Do you write a summary of what the reading is? Maybe. Maybe you summarize some key points that you find in the reading. But you don't summarize everything in the reading. You, who has time for that? You summarize the key points. You are a burglar. You got into a rich person's house. There's a big TV. Leave the TV. It's too big. You can't carry that. Go for the jewelry, go for the cash, grab it, run. Right? The cops are coming. You don't have time. Right? Studio. You have a studio assignment too, right? So go into the reading, aggressively, identify what's valuable, grab it, leave, store it here. Write it down. Here are the things that are significant from this reading, according to me, as in you. And then see if you can tie them together. See if you can tie them. Well, first of all, we don't assume that you are empty vessels and it's our job to fill you. We assume that you are the world's foremost experts on your own life experience. So what have you experienced before in your, in your rich lives so far that connect to these key points? What have you learned before in other classes that connects to these key points? Make those connections. How do you make those connections? You make those connections through writing. Does this writing have to be good? No. As a matter of fact, here's what I suggest. I suggest going in here. Are you, who, who loves to write? I, I have loved moments of writing. But in general, it's hard to love writing because it's kind of traumatic. Because what do you write? It's like, mm, okay, my first sentence. Okay, here I go. Um, no, 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 no. That's not right. Right? It's painful. There's a lot at stake. Right? So, that's what this is for. There's nothing at stake, or very little at stake. To get flowing, um, you might just start with, you know, Professor Cowherd... Uh, Gave me this thing, gave, you know. You just write what comes off, off the top of your head. Um, and then you just get in the flow of it, and you just keep writing. And you write uh, as the thoughts come out. And you get in the habit of just having the fingers moving and your brain engaged. And you write through the key points of, of the reading. You make connections to those key points to things from your life experience and from your education. And as you draw those things together, what happens? What happens when you write? You've written before. What happens as you write? When you sit down to write, do you know where it's going to go? You might think you know where it's going to go. You're going to sit down and write, and I already know what I'm going to say, and I know what the conclusion's going to be. There's nothing new. I just got to write it, right? But then what actually happens when you sit down to write? This magical thing happens called discovery, called critical thinking, called ex exploration. 
it's not so different from when you sketch. So this is your sketch pad. Why do we sketch? To come up with ideas. It's not because we have an idea. We have an inkling of an idea. But how do we turn the inkling into something more useful? We sketch. This is the exact same thing. If you know what it's like to have a hunch and, ah, sorry, I can't talk right now. i got to draw this. And you take that hunch and you sketch it, and you're like, ah, that didn't work. Ah, that didn't work. Wait, wait, ah, ah, aha, oh, and now you draw it, right? So that's the process of sketching. That's the process of writing. So that's what this is for. This is a sketch pad. You can write anything you want. I might read it. I might not read it. I am going to grade it, though. If there's nothing here, I'm going to give you a zero. If there's a little bit here, but it doesn't look like much effort went into it, I'll give you a one. If there's a serious uh, sketch process, of working through your thinking and trying to explore the, what possible connections there might be and some inkling of an insight somewhere along the line, then you get the maximum number of points, two. Is this worth a lot? No. Uh, it's not worth a lot. There's probably going to, there's 10 paradigms, 10 of these times 2, 20 points. It's worth uh, not very much. But it's a crucial step in the process. The grade value is much smaller than the content value. This is going to be the secret weapon of the next bit of writing you're going to do that I will explain <coughs> next. Okay, and please interrupt me with questions. This is supposed to be, this is probably the last time we'll sit in this arrangement. We'll be moving furniture a lot. This is going to be very interactive, uh, so uh, I don't want to postpone the interaction part. Please ask questions. So the next part is an analysis. You will, um, for every, every week we'll be talking about a specific a type of urban formation and you will we will be talking about what that might look like then you go to Google Earth or your favorite uh, source <coughs> of images of cities wherever they are it might be your hometown might be this spot or it might be Kathmandu it might be anywhere on the world uh, because we all have access to every place on the planet. And this is, turns out to be an extremely useful thing for this kind of course. So take what you know from the lecture, from the reading, uh, and uh, try to find a place on the planet that is a good example of that. So grab the image. Use your package of skills and tools mostly Adobe Creative Suite, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. Each of these tools have their own strengths and weaknesses, Sketchbook Pro. Um, use these tools to alter the images to create, not a diagram, we'll talk about that, but an analysis, something that is actually testing whether or not the pattern fits, whether or not this piece of the planet fits the pattern. And so we'll talk about this every week, all semester long. How do you do a powerful visual analysis of urban form? And so that's going to be uh, an analysis assignment <coughs> that is due every Tuesday morning, two hours before class starts. You can do it Monday night, but I need to be able to get to it Tuesday morning. Okay. So that's the visual analysis every Tuesday. You'll, you'll upload it to Blackboard, um, and you'll, hear, you'll be seeing examples of it in this lecture, and uh, we'll be talking about it. The next thing is on Thursday, you will be writing a formal response. The formal response needs to be 
no more than 200 words, and I'm sorry about that. You will understand soon, if you don't already, why I apologize, because it is difficult to write effectively if you only have 200 words to do it. And I'm going to actually prescribe most of the sentences in this 200-word paragraph. The first sentence is a thesis statement. The second sentence is the starting position of your argument that does not, uh, that, that you think your colleagues and your audience and, and I will go along with you. You have a starting point for your argument. And then you use evidence to construct a step-by-step -step, uh, logical sequence of points that convinces us of your thesis statement. And then you end it with some type of uh, question or pointing towards future direction of further investigation. And you do it all in 200 words. And you do that by Thursday morning at 7.30 and you submit it on Blackboard. <coughs> then you boil it down even further into one sentence. <coughs> and you go, you go to this last tab, which is the position, which takes you to this um, Prezi site. Has anyone heard of Prezi? Ah, OK. So you go to Prezi, and there's, there's already um, someone's argument. I have asserted my top, my name is Robert. My topic area is the Kraton Surakarta. You'll figure out what that is. And I make my statement. The formal urban structure is not just a passive reflection of cultural meanings. It is more importantly an instrument of ongoing negotiations of power establishing a hierarchy of the social order. What is he talking about? Um, I am stating my position. I am saying that it's not the city is not just a passive reflection of culture or a random outcome of emergent forces. It is a deliberate instrument. It's a tool of power. It puts people in their place and makes me the king. And that's what the city's job is. It's not just a place where things happen. It is what makes things happen. It's a radical concept of how cities work. And we're going to be talking about that. Any questions? So this is a thesis I've been developing for several decades. Uh, I was the royal architect for the king of Java, so I have an inside scoop on this. You don't. So, but. Still, we're on an equal footing in a lot of ways. Um, and that's um, how I want to kind of set the framework of this course, is that, um, as I said, you are not empty vessels to be filled with my profound knowledge. Uh, we are all collaborators in the larger mission of figuring out how cities work. What do cities do? How do cities mean what they mean? And uh, how many people got a chance to read the reading? Um, I'm not looking at who read and who didn't. I'm just getting a sense of how to present this point. OK. So that helps. Um, so I'm going to switch to content now. But before I do, does anyone want to ask me questions about these components of the weekly sequence of our activities in here? Like, you might want to ask, really? You think this is only going to take six hours a week? This sounds like uh, as much work as I put into that whole course last semester. Well, here's the thing. Please don't let it take more, much more than six hours of your time. If it starts to take more than six hours of your time every week, please let me know. My intention is to empower you so that you are confident using these very effective tools, not just for this class, but for everything you do. I am very selfishly teaching you to be better students when I get you in thesis. I keep getting thesis students who don't know how to do this, and I'm very selfishly 
wanting to get pieces of students who know how to do this. Yes? Could, uh, so what, what's exactly the rundown of assignments? Is it reading assigned on Thursday, then journal analysis due on that Tuesday next week? Um, let's go back to this view. That's an excellent question. So the lecture happens on Thursday, today. Um, you should then, between Thursday and Tuesday, you should do three, the next three things. You should read the reading, take notes, and then pull it together in an exploratory piece of writing that's just for you just to be an active reader. So these two go together. And based on this, these three experiences, now explore the world. Find a chunk of urban fabric and analyze it. And submit that on Tuesday morning. So read journal analysis all by Tuesday? By Tuesday morning. And then response by Thursday? And then the response by Thursday put it in a one sentence, and put it, on, put it on the Prezi. Now, why are you putting it on the Prezi? You're putting it on the Prezi because you're trying to find who else are your allies and who are your opponents. It's not so clear when we talk about these first three topics. And we might, might not even do the Prezi. I'm not sure. But we'll see how it goes. We'll try to do it. But eventually, I've changed this course. This semester, for the first time, this course is going to be much more about the 20th century and the burning issues of the present moment. And so uh, we are going to have debates. We are going to form teams every Thursday, and we are going to figure things out in, uh, in a debate format, and that's why we'll be in a circle. So does that make sense? Six moving parts. Um, we'll talk about the analyses on Tuesdays. We'll engage in debate for the, for the first two-thirds of Thursdays, and then I'll give you a uh, crushingly dense and rich lecture at the end of Thursday for the next week. Any questions on that? And it's all going to happen in three hours of class and six hours out of class. Please block out your schedules accordingly. Um, some of you who get good at this will be spending less than six hours a week on this class, and you'll be very effective. There are tricks, and we'll talk about those tricks and techniques, and we'll share them, and we'll support each other. And when a question comes up, you ask the question on Facebook, and when I respond to the question, uh, you all hear the response to the question, um, except for Zach, uh, unless Ashley helps him out. And then, at a certain point, you'll be answering each other's questions more effectively than I will, because what do I know? I'm not doing this. <coughs> yes, sir. So we don't really need Facebook. Is that, is well, you, don't, you don't need Facebook, <laughs> but everyone else does. But you don't need Facebook because someone's going to help you get access to the content on Facebook. There's going to be an ongoing discussion, and it's going to be unfolding in real time. And I would love it if you were part of that exchange. So that's, that's the thing. We're using social media to get quick answers so um, you don't get stuck. I hate getting stuck and not moving forward when I could be moving forward if I just had someone to help me out. Does that make sense? Yes, Carly. You post the response to Blackboard. That's a 200-word okay. response. And then it might be the first sentence <coughs> that you post on a Prezi, or some version, some encapsulation of a position okay. that can then we can then debate. So um, <coughs> hopefully, my goal is for these all of these different things that seem so overwhelming right now to seem like one continuous gesture each week. Like breathing, you just come to class on Thursday, read, respond, analyze, resp and it just happens in a smooth arc. And we're going to do it 10 times. Uh, and so it'll become quite natural, I hope. Yes? So, uh, do you get a class where you're talking about your Yes. 
Exactly. How's our time? Okay. Um, so, other questions? So let's move to some content. Since um, not many, you know, only about half or so read the thing, um, and time is short, I'm going to do it this way. Okay, so when I was first hired, I was hired to teach this course and the Urban Studio. But when we uh, started the master's program, we had to eliminate two courses this course, and the Urban Studio. And so that's why I became your structures teacher for some of you. Um, but this is the course that I've been training to teach for my entire adult, adult life. This is the course I was hired to teach, uh, and I'm very happy to be teaching it. This is my favorite thing that I do um, at Wentworth. Um, this is a hugely important topic. And if you read the beginning uh, paragraphs of the syllabus, basically what I am putting forward is that this is the kind of, these are the kinds of issues that architects used to deal with. Architects used to deal with the world, the built environment. We were the master designers of the physical environment. Then something happened. We specialized on buildings, and planners and urban designers took over. First of all, planners took over the larger structure. And they sensed there was a hole missing, so um, a set of designers took up urban design when planning became more policy-based. And um, But then that whole thing started to break down. Architects focused on buildings as objects. Ar I call that architecture with a capital A. And for the past uh, 50 years or so, architecture with a capital A has been doing tremendous things in the area of architectural design, um, especially since the 1980s, uh, with a particular focus on the aesthetics um, of, um, of modern architectural design. Uh, but in the meantime, there hasn't been much design happening in the rest of the world. The design, when you look out the windows, if we were on the front of the building especially, uh, when you look out the windows and you see the world, was that designed by a designer? No. It's pretty much the outcome of a transportation engineer's uh, set of problem solving. And especially in the United States, transportation engineering uh, became automobile engineering. How do you get from point A to point B most efficiently in a car? And so the built environment, especially in the United States, especially since World War II, became the result of doing that, solving that problem tremendously well. The traffic engineers have been successful beyond the norms of history. They are so good at what they do. But what they do and what they were trying to do was extremely narrow. And if other things happen, uh, not their problem. That's someone else's problem. It's not their department. That's not the problem they were given to solve. You can't blame them. They built that freeway through Boston, and they did a tremendously excellent job at doing that. The fact that it cut the north end off from the rest of Boston not their, not their job. They did a great job at what they were supposed to do. So that's, in a way, a very short explanation of how we reached the present condition. We were so successful in what we did in the 20th century uh, that our primary problems of the 21st century are a result not of the failures of the 20th century, but of the tremendous, unprecedented successes of the 20th century. Economic boom, global cultural transformations. Uh, it's unprecedented in human history, our successes. And um, it may not seem like it in what I say for the rest of the semester, but 
I don't for a moment want to neglect the fact that we have cured diseases. We have raised huge populations out of poverty uh, and, and increased uh, the, the happiness and livelihood of countless, actually we are going to count them, uh, humans on the planet. So, um, but there were some secondary unintended consequences, and I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> planetary death. Good luck with that, because um, we're done. Now it's time for you. So I feel bad on behalf of my generation, kind of feel a little guilty about hoisting this mess on you. So uh, I've been sent here by the old people uh, to try to give you some hints and some hands on how to fix things. Because it turns out design, which has been neglected, because remember designers, the most talented designers in the world, not to be chauvinistic about architecture, but we really are the most sophisticated designers out there, right? Um, the best designers in the world have been doing these tremendously wonderful boxes. And where the boxes go, not our department. What happens around our boxes and between our boxes, not our department. Well, it is now, because the world needs design. It's gone too long without design. And a big reason why the world is in such a mess is because design has neglected most of what happens. How many buildings are designed by architects? Not many. One or two percent. How much of the world is designed by architects? Not much. Less than that. So um, it turns out, and I love this example, uh, that we that design actually holds the key to solving problems that uh, no other approach, no other method, no other way of thinking, no other way of problem solving can match. Um, design cannot do it alone, it turns out. It has to be part of a much larger vision. That's why it's not going to be Frank Lloyd Wright or Corbusier sweeping in saying, here's the grand vision, you're welcome, off I go, build that. No, it's going to be collaborative and it's going to be filled with problems to be solved along the way. The reason we have so many problems is because as problems emerged over the course of the 20th century, um, the, the common response was, well, of course there are problems. You haven't finished building my beautiful utopian vision. When you finish my beautiful utopian vision, everything will be great. Or you take a shortcut on my beautiful utopian vision, that's why things are going wrong. Or I will come up with the next beautiful utopian vision to solve that problem. Or market forces will solve it, or technology will solve it. But it turns out market forces are sometimes distorted and technology doesn't come along when you need it. It comes along when it's ready to come along. And so this um, necessity is the mother of invention. You can't exactly count on that. And this market forces will find a way to resolve things. How has that worked? Not so well. Um, and we'll get into this. So how many people are there in the world? How many? Seven billion. How many people will there be in the year 2100? 10 billion. How did we get here? Um, in a way, I prefer it if no one read that, because I like to do it this way. I like to look at human history starting from the agricultural revolution. We used to uh, wander around looking for food, um, but then someone figured out, hey, if you plant you know these, these berries and these grains that we really love? Well, if you plant them and come back next season, there, there's, more, there's a more plentiful food supply. That was the dawn of the agricultural revolution. It didn't start in one place and spread everywhere else. It started in multiple places. And as soon as you have a food surplus, you start to be able to have um, things other than food gathering happening. You get to have specialization. And that is the root cause of cities. Human settlements are the direct result, an inevitable result, of food surplus. When you have food surplus, you can have 
Some people making barrels, some people making wagon wheels, some people studying uh, in the universities, some people becoming priests and kings. And um, all of a sudden, you have an economy of exchange, and you have settlement patterns that depend on people being to communicate and exchange with each other, and you get uh, human settlements. Um, but even after we started having human settlements, there were limitations on population growth. And so for vast majority of human history, which, by the way, starts you know, way back here, but for a vast majority of human history, there are about, I don't know, less than 10 million people in the world. So we went from a 10 million person world to a 1 billion person world very abruptly. It happened uh, in just about um, 3,000 years. It's like a blink of an eye from 10 million to 1 billion. And this is about the time of the Industrial Revolution, about the time the United States became independent from England. This is Thomas Malthus. He uh, was an amateur mathematician. And he said, hey, wait a minute. Now that the world is one billion people, uh, I can't help but noticing that every time people get married, they have lots of kids. They have more than two kids. So they're replacing, they're more than replacing their own uh, number. They are expanding. And that is an exponential pattern. When parents have, on average, more than two children each, that results in exponential growth. I'm not going to go into the math. No time. Um, and is our food supply expanding exponentially? No. At best, we can just add some land, but we can't double, then quadruple the amount of land. We're already pressing at the boundaries of arable land. Very little of the planet's surface is capable of supporting agriculture. How much water is available? It's limited. And that's back in 1776. Um, so he said, listen, the obvious solution is to uh, give vasectomies to poor people and minorities. It's the obvious thing to do. And so that's what he promoted. Because he said, listen, us rich white males, we have to survive somehow. And we have to watch out for ourselves. Let's keep the numbers of poor people and minorities down, down, down. So that was his proposal. So I'm taking that same graph. This is the same graph, but I'm going to squash. I'm sorry, I don't have the animation. I'm going to squash this period and stretch this out so we can really see what happens next. OK, we're going to do this fast because there's no time. Uh, we hit 2 billion in 130 years. So the first billion, the first spike, it took 3,000 years. The second billion, uh, it took 130 years. The third billion, it took uh, 50 years, 30 years, 35 years. And about that time, we got a look of the planet from space. And Buckminster Fuller said, you know this planet? It's like a spaceship. It doesn't have a lot of inputs and outputs. It's kind of a fixed resource. So he kind of had a new insight that he added to Malthus's insight, that this is a finite amount of material. And you can't just go on forever like this. But what are we going to do? Uh, we're not going to neuter the poor and minority populations, um, by the way. So 15 more years, um, we hit 4 billion. And uh, uh, if, you, if anyone has emotional anxieties, you might want to leave the room, um, at least if you haven't read my thing yet. So this is pretty scary, isn't it? Here we hit 6 billion. Uh, around the year 2000, we hit 7 billion a year ago. Uh, what's going to happen? Resource warfare, scarcity, the rich against the poor. Let's um, build a wall to keep the poor people out. Um, so we hit 7 billion last year, then we keep going. What is going to happen?
Wait, wait. Oh, thank God. <clears throat> Don't ask me why. Look it up. But within a certain degree of certainty, let me get to that one. This is the prospect. It could go like that, but it could go like that. But chances are it's going to go like that. And it, they say 9.4 because they like to be precise and fool you that, that we know, but we don't know. Just for the sake of argument, let's call it 10 billion. It's easy to round off. Okay, so we're heading into the 10 billion person world, and it's going to be that way forever, or at least until as far as we can see. And so it was the 10 million person world for a long, 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 long time, and then in the blink of an eye, let's change the scale back to the real scale. That's the real scale. In the blink of an eye, we hit 10, million, 10 billion, and we hold there forever. So this is a pretty important moment in human history. Um, that's the reason why. When you watch the video, just study that slide more carefully. And um, so. We're off, we're off the hook, right? Everything's fine? Everything's cool? No. Now what? Well, it turns out that the impact, the human impact, is not just population. It's the per capita consumption and pollution. It's the per capita impact times the population. If the population levels up, but our level of consumption goes up even faster, yeah, that's what's happened, then we're not off the hook. We're still in, in deep doo-doo. Um, so, uh, so we're in trouble. Even with the leveling off of population, we've got a very, very serious set of issues in the next century or so. Sorry. Um, OK, now what does that have to do with this course? <laughs> Well, the whole story of this occurring is the story of the human historical process of urbanization. And the whole story of how this turns out, we know how it's going to turn out in terms of the numbers of people. That's done. That's settled within a certain range around 10 billion. What is completely open is what is the overall impact of those 10 billion people. We can either live like Americans. By the way, there are 7 billion people in the world right now who know with absolute certainty that if not in their own lifetimes, in their children's lifetime, or at the very latest, their grandchildren's lifetime, they will be living like those people on TV. Those people on TV that get broadcast to our little village all the way from Southern California. And so every village in the world has a TV. Every village in the world was watching Baywatch <coughs> in the 1990s. They were watching, uh, what are they watching? I don't know, you never tell. But whatever it is, whatever you're watching, they're watching it too. And they're saying, they're sitting there on this beautiful, nice straw mats on the floor, and the, you know, their cousin just got a motorbike and they're sitting there watching it, and every seven-year-old girl knows that when she grows up, she's not going to have a motorbike. She's going to have a car, like that sexy, hot, blonde woman uh, in Southern California TV, in, the, in that TV box thing. And uh, I'm going to wear makeup, and I'm going to, and uh, my friends are all going to shoot each other because that's what they do in America, <coughs> at least as depicted on TV. So. Um, the images of the future are being broadcast and renewed daily to the villages of the world. And the world knows with absolute certainty that either they, their children, or their grandchildren are going to live like Americans. How many planets do we need if 10 billion people are living like Americans? Five or so. We need five planet Earths if everyone lives like an American. If all 10 billion people live like Americans. How many planets do we need if we figure things out? 
we, <laughs> we have our life and our, the benefits of our lifestyle get better and better and better every year, but our ecological footprint goes down, down, down. Uh, we eat one less hamburger a month. We, instead of driving everywhere, we drive some places. Everyone owns a car because <laughs> we're Americans, right? But what if you just drive a little less, have one less hamburger a month, and insulate your house? And our electricity starts to become uh, sourced from other sources, renewable sources. Our food supply becomes healthier. Uh, if all of this starts to happen, we could get to the point where we continue to live a better and better lifestyle, uh, and our footprint approaches that of India's. How many people can the planet support if uh, we have the footprint of Indians in India? 30 billion. So somewhere between having the impact of Americans and having the impact of Indians, there is a way for us to actually make this work. The big variable is how we live. The big variable is how our cities work. If you live in Wyoming, in Jackson Hole, uh, it turns out that it seems like that's more in touch with nature. It seems like that's the way humans were meant to live, in the mountains, in the open air, uh, hiking in the hills, and breathing fresh air. That's a much more ecological existence, right? Not like those dirty Manhattanites cramped up in their buildings and spewing smoke. Actually, it turns out that the average person in Manhattan has the ecological footprint much closer to the Indian. And the person in the mountains of the Rocky Mountains uh, actually has the ecological footprint many times higher than the average American. That's the highest ecological footprint in the world, mostly because of driving. <coughs> driving is connected with way, the way cities work. Food supply is connected with the way cities work. <coughs> Energy consumption in general is very much connected with the way cities work. Consumption and human impact is all very directly connected with the way cities work. And cities are becoming ubiquitous um, around the world. Um, no time for this. Um, one of the key points in the reading is, um, well, first let's start with this. This looks normal to us, right? Pretty good architecture. Right? This is the way we live in cities. Well, it turns out that um, one of the key points in the, in the reading uh, is that around World War II, there were a little less than a billion people in the developed world, and around a billion people in the, in the less developed world, what we called at that time the third world. By the time we get to 10 billion, there will be a little bit more than a billion people in the developed world, increased ever so slightly, and yes, around 9 billion people in the less developed world. Um, this is a s picture of a city in the less developed world. This looks normal to us, but this is how the wealthiest 5% might live, and the rest live here. Um, and there's a very unhealthy relationship between this urban formation. This is a, a, a barbed wire fortified wall. There are armed guards. Um, these people, uh, it's a very oppressive situation. And it turns out that there are alternatives. And we'll talk about this um, over the course of the semester. So um, the name of the reading is How Cities Mean. So in the context of the global, how is this all going to turn out? How does the story turn out in the end? With 10 billion people, how much of a footprint are we going to have? Are we going to have some people living like kings and the vast majority locked out? Or are we going to uh, do things in a much healthier way, as represented by several Latin American cities who are testing the idea that design can play a significant role 
in, in changing the game. It just These are game-changing moves that change everything. And a lot of people think, well, there's no alternative. This is natural. This is the way things are. This is the way things have always been. This is the way things will always be. Well, this is an urban form that reinforces that condition. This is an urban form that unlocks that condition. So how do cities play a role in this way? Well, let's start with talking about how buildings do it, something we know about, something we know something about. And um, in your history courses, you've been talking about this, and you've been, used, you've been developing a set of terms of reference. Um, but just to make sure you have these tools, I'm going to very quickly go over this. Um, this is an example, the Lincoln Memorial. It's taken from Nelson Goodman's uh, chapter called How Buildings Mean. And according to Nelson Goodman, buildings mean in four ways. Way one is exemplification. I mean, no. What is way one? Way one is inscription, that the building has writing on it, and it says uh, exactly what the meaning it's trying to convey. So the first way buildings mean is through verbal communication. This is the Lincoln Memorial uh, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union. The memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. The meaning of this building is inscribed verbally. The second way uh, buildings mean is through what Nelson Goodman calls exemplification, what you probably have talked about as actual real life experience. If you were plopped, if you were blindfolded and kidnapped and plopped down here and they take the blindfold <coughs> off and this is what you encounter, you go, ah, if you were from Mars and were placed here on this planet and they took the blindfold off, you would go, ah, that's something. Look at that reflection. Look at the sunlight. There's someone in there. That person is important. This is important. This huge space with this axis that I'm experiencing the reflection. It's all, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know anything from school. You don't have to read <coughs> anything. You experience it. 90% of what we do in the architecture studio is exemplification. Thank God. This is what we do really well. We experience space, and then we build spaces by designing the experience we want people to have. The third way is through metaphor. So we know what these columns mean because we study the history of Greek and Roman architecture. We know that they mean democracy and strength and virtue and valor and uh, noble, timeless principles. And so we have this cultural understanding that is a learned understanding. And we use that filter to interpret what we experience. So number three, by metaphor, by analogy. And finally, number four is through icons and symbolism. Um, actually, icons and symbolism, this is still part of number three. The fourth one, um, I apologize, the fourth one is things happen. Uh, this gets put on a dollar, on a five dollar bill, and things happen. On the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Uh, the protest against the Vietnam War, the Million Mom March, the Million Man March, the, the protests. This is the, the living room of the United States of America. This is where we act out the drama on the human stage. Um, the Twin Towers used to mean this is how bad architecture can be uh, you know, driven by capitalism of lower Manhattan. <coughs> um, and now it means something completely different. It means uh, they hate us for our freedoms and we're going to push back. So things happen. History, events that we cannot predict, transform the meaning of buildings. And that's the fourth way. We have no control over that. That's why we focus on number two, on exemplification, on experience. 
Well, those same four principles operate in the way cities mean. Cities mean in very specific ways. Cities uh, support the stories we tell about ourselves. So we tell stories about ourselves, and then we build our cities according to those stories. And we experience our cities according to those stories. And so our cities, once built, reinforce those stories to us. So this is um, about representation. Let me do a <coughs> quick side trip. Actually, I'm just going to show a few of these very quickly um, because we don't have much time. This is the way uh, Weldon Priest's urban studio used to analyze uh, urban form. Uh, I've gone to a lot of good schools and taught at others, and it wasn't until I arrived at Wentworth that I really understood what was possible in terms of architectural drawing skills and the representation of the city. Um, one of the biggest tragedies of this program is the end of the urban studio because the work that Weldon Priest was doing with students over the course of 15 years was unprecedented anywhere in my experience. The way he got students to draw uh, was so powerful in capturing the reality of urban experience um, uh, using pencils. It was all using pencils and photography and projectors and tracing. And it was just a tremendous accomplishment and one which I hope we can build on, even though we don't have Weldon. We don't have uh, the endless hours in the studio that he had access to. Um, but we're going to make up for that by your commitment and energy um, and the electronic tools we have at our disposal. Uh, so here are some classical representations <coughs> of cities. Here in Genoa, Italy, there's a uh, high-resolution photograph which is directly translated into a drawing, which is a simplification of the photograph um, to bring out certain key points. Here are some examples of analysis, uh, analyses performed by students last year in this course. Um, by taking high-resolution photographs and not drawing a diagram on top of it, but by taking what would be a, you can start with a diagram on top of it, but then you have to convert the diagram, change the diagram, alter the geometry of the diagram so that it matches exactly the physical reality on the ground. It's not enough to just say, oh, the city works like this. No. You have to actually fit it on the reality and test it and ask the question. So a diagram asserts a, a conclusion. There's no question. The diagram says, this is how it works. And we look at it. In five seconds, you've got it. The message is immediate and clear. That's what diagrams do. It's like a cartoon. But then the challenge is to ask the question, does the city work like this? And so you try to find the diagram, the key attributes of the diagram, in the actual physical reality of the city. And so um, this is what we'll be doing all semester for every Tuesday. Google Earth, the 3D view is not so good. For a three, 3D oblique views are great because they're more spatial. But um, <coughs> Google Earth has this modeling thing which mixes 2D and 3D, which is not very good. So if you're going to go for oblique views, go to Bing, which is now called, you'll figure it out. It's called something else. But these are very effective um, analyses. And you notice that it looks like, what is he talking about? I don't see what he's talking about. It's basically subtle colorations that highlight the geometric and formal spatial character of what's going on. Dubai, China, Rio de Janeiro.
And so um, these are all too dark. So because of time, I'm going to put up uh, a lecture uh, previously given on the city of Surakarta and um, ask you to view that instead of me delivering it live here. Um, and with the reading, try to find a piece of the world that was designed ahead of time. It didn't emerge. It's not the result of an infrastructure system, but it's something that was deliberately designed. <coughs> so some pattern imprinted on the urban fabric that exemplifies an order that was conceived in the human mind and imposed on the planet in the form of a city or a chunk of city. So some highly geometric form of city. And the key candidates are cities that are geometric because they perform some type of spiritual, religious, cosmic ordering function. So the temple complexes of Asia and Mesoamerica, the ancient cities of China and Japan, the uh, um, the religious centers of the world that the ordering principles of the city have to do with some cosmological relationship between humans and the deities. Um, and I apologize for not getting into this more deeply. But um, are other questions? Yes. So Correct, and that is fine. It doesn't have to be currently in use as a city. But what needs, the key thing that needs to be there is the imprint of a geometric order that was imposed ahead of time. A lot of these uh, things that we'll be looking at, especially in week three, are, are orders that emerge, like ant colonies. And we're talking about the opposite of the ant colony pattern. We're talking about a single mind, in most cases, uh, conceived of a geometry, imposed it on the planet, and it is pretty much intact, whether it's still used or not. And uh, questions will come up as you do this. Please use uh, Facebook to ask your questions. I will be posting a series, a checklist of things to look for in your visual analysis uh, as you execute that between now and Tuesday. Okay? Let's take that picture.